Hey, 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 it is Friday. Welcome, everyone. It's my favorite time here. Good morning. We just got done with an office hours. We got done with a clubhouse. Now we're on to IG Live. Let's get the questions rolling and moving here. Good morning. Good to see you. 11 a.m. Pacific time. We are doing training on our go, no go plan. How to utilize the go, no go plan. We're going to be talking about it. If you want the exercises, guys, or my books on it, David at dmelzer.com. I will send it to you. Audiobook, ebook, mail it to you. Pay for shipping. I don't mind. Just email me, David at dmelzer.com. Uh, 949-298-2905 if you want to join my text community. Good to see you. Good morning. It is training Friday. Good morning, everybody. The questions are rolling in. Let's get warmed up. Here we go. Not that we're already not warmed up. What quotes are resonating with you right now? Uh, the one that resonates most is the truth vibrates the fastest. We had an extraordinary clubhouse about the truth and the triggers of the truth and why we lie, manipulate, cheat, oversell, exaggerate, all these different things. Where does that come from? Is it our childhood? Is it quantum in our being? Uh, is it a response to survival? There were so many different things. Is omission, lying, all of these. What? Wait, hold on a second. Samir is here. Happy Friday from North Carolina from the incredible professional basketball player, which will be themed today. Samir is here. I think that rhymes. Oh, there's the birthday boy, Justin. Uh, good to see you finally here. Welcome, my friend, as always. Here we go. The questions have been rolling in. Customer focus pitch works nowadays. Look, uh, a pitch needs credibility, emotional attachment. If it's customer centric in the reasons, impacts, and capabilities, it absolutely will work as long as you can articulate the quantifiable value greater than what you're asking for. Uh, so we'll go ahead uh, and uh, take another question. I know my friend Britton is here. Uh, the president and partner of Weber Global Management uh, will be joining about 8.05. So let's get these questions rolling. Until then, thank you for coming early and being ready for us. Who is this? After reading The Course of Miracles many times, is there a quote that sticks with you? I am as God created me. I am health, I am wealth, I am happiness. What am I doing to interfere with it? Christina Madrigal, the big birthday wishes for Justin Pugh. The Justin Pugh, uh, happy birthday from everyone. Samir, happy you are family as well. Uh, we are going to Mercer's graduation in New Orleans, Samir, by the way. What's your favorite collection at home or in your office? Uh, my favorite collection is my lanyard collection. So I have thousands of lanyards like this one from the coolest... Uh, Super Bowl, Pro Bowl, Masters, Kentucky Derby, Breeders' Cup, ESPY, Emmys, Oscars, Grammys, everywhere I've gone. Saving those uh, lanyards uh, is my gold collection. It's my scrapbook. Let's just put it that way. Natalie, hi, good to see you. Mike Mamola, nice to see you. Everybody, welcome here. Let's do this. How do you stay focused when obstacles try to bring you down and impress? Obstacles don't try to bring me down. Obstacles do not make me depress. Obstacles get me excited because it's going to push me into what? A better place, a better position. I had utilized faith in order to know that my destination is greater than that I can imagine. And so obstacles, setback, uh, pain, failures, mistakes, anything that you want to call it, they do not put me down or depress me. They excite me because that which made the obstacles, that which made the mountains in front of me, walks within me, walks besides me. So why should I get depressed or down? I should get excited that it's just an indicator that I got a better place to be. And I'm just going in the wrong direction. That I have complete faith of the ultimate GPS, not only when I miss an exit, get a flat tire, get off the track and go to the donut store instead of where I'm supposed to be going. It not only reroutes me, but it redestinations me. It redestinations me to a better place, a better position, or makes my position better. That's what it does for me. So I don't have to stay focused. I got excited. I get more focused because the obstacles are indicators that I need to get more focused, that I need to understand where the better place, the better position is. That pain setback 
failure, mistakes are only indicators. No reason to get down and depressed ever. Just if you feel down or depressed, just spend minutes or moments there. Remind yourself what you are made of. You are happiness, health, and wealth. You just have to determine and shift the paradigm and perspective on what you're doing to interfere with that. That's all you got to do. All righty, let's see here. Britain is here. Let me go backwards unless uh, she wants to comment here. Let me grab, there it is. All right, Britain, he, sorry. Uh, President and partner of Weber Global Management talking about investments and saving tips. Oh, it that looks like an airplane to me. Yeah. Very cool. I've done m m many of these from an airplane. Very cool. Oh, okay. Glad I'm on brand. <laughs> How are you doing, David? Good, man. Well, look, uh, you and I, I want to start with, uh, in the investment world, I always say the biggest mistake that people make, number one, is they don't know their timing and risk tolerance. Sure. Right? They'll go to someone like you and say, hey, you know, what should I do? And have no idea of what they want out of what they're doing. And that's a huge mistake. And two, the bigger mistake is they don't go ask people like you for help. Right? We find people it, sit in the situation we want to be in and ask them for directions. You specifically are helping millennials uh, with these type of saving tips, strategies, uh, in the post-pandemic era of what we're supposed to do, how can millennials specifically prepare uh, for their savings and what strategies are you helping with? Sure, um, David, yeah. So, I mean, the vast majority of my clients uh, don't look like me, they're a lot older. And so this has been a recent transition for me into helping millennials and helping more people my age. And it's something I actually really love and I'm passionate about um, having become a multimillionaire in my 20s and recognizing that it really just is principles and following a pattern. The biggest thing that I work for uh, and I work towards with my friends and peers and, and other millennials is setting good habits and making sure that you get those good habits in place. Because as you know, um, the, the earlier you get good habits and principles in place, the sooner you're going to become wealthy and the sooner you're going to be able to actually build wealth for yourself. So a lot of it is going over things like, you know, let, let's work on setting a budget. Let's figure out how much money you got coming in, where your money's going. Let's figure out ways to track your net worth and, and um, find something that makes sense for you. And, and cause everybody's financial picture is different. Uh, we're all kind of unique, like we have our own fingerprint and things like that. So um, a lot of it is going in, going in and then setting those principles and then, okay, all right. So what, what skills do you have? You know, what sector do you work in? Are you in tech? If you're in tech, you probably have a leg up on tech. If you're working in finance, you'll know more about financial products. And so, like you said, figuring out risk tolerance and also investment objectives to go that direction, because that'll, that'll kind of, uh, keep you, keep you where with what you know, and, um, keeping you sticking to what you know, because once you start getting out of your area of expertise, that's where you can run into some big problems, especially in the investing world. Um, yeah, if I mean, don't come to me for a haircut, you know, <laughs> You know, speak, speaking of which, you know, you dropped out of college. Um, what do you think you missed most from dropping out of college? You know, the thing that I'm finding that I missed most is networking. Um, a lot of my friends, they go to college, they get in these great programs, and they immediately have a connection of like-minded people around them. And so for me, uh, I had to build that organically. And also one thing that really worked against me is I, I am 26 years old. And so it was, it was a little bit more difficult to get people to buy into the idea that as a tw early, you know, to mid 20 something year old, um, I have, I have some value add. And so I had to be very careful about um, how I presented myself, how I carried myself because I didn't want people thinking, you know, he's just, you know, some, some 26 year old kid, how much does he know? So it was a battle on building the network, but also establishing myself with credibility, but you know, persistency and consistency, and then also um, making some really good investment calls and you, you'll, you'll get there. Yeah. How about patience? You know, you yeah. started when you're 18 years old and you know, there are no such things as overnight successes. You have to build the credibility to create the emotional attachment, you know, especially in the, wealth management phase of dealing with older people. And here you are, 18 year old dropout from college, trying to tell a 50 year old like me about investment strategies of how to make millions of dollars. What did you do over that period of time to blend that patience, to give yourself the credibility and allow yourself to get the emotional attachment since you didn't have the huge network? I think you pointed out, I went to Occidental College, which you know the only place I joke around that would let me play football, but there's 1500 uh, you know, 1,500 students, so I might as well have not gone to college for networking. You know, with 1,500 students, my high school was three times as big. Right. Uh, I should, you know, if I understood the power of networking, I would have went to USC, especially when I went, 
it was the easiest school in the world to get into. All you needed was a pulse. Uh, so I, you know, I love the hypocrisy of the USC graduates that are my age. I'm like, you know what? I was uh, one of those guys. I know what USC was like when you were there. So let, let's not get up on our high uh, pedestal because it's so difficult now to get into. But for you, how did you build that credibility and emotional attachment? You know, the, the, it sounds kind of cliche, but the biggest thing was, you know, focus on myself. I, I knew that as long as I was consistent, I had a personal track record. I was financially successful on my own. I just had to not mess up and I just had to remain consistent. So consistency was key, but also educate myself and put myself in, in streams of, you know, people I wanted to network with. So, um, after spending a lot of time traveling the world, I decided, okay, it's time to buckle down and get actually into the financial field. So I started working at Fidelity Investments. Um, it was an entry level job, but what it did is it got me credit. It got me credentials and credibility. So I got my series seven license. I got my series 63 license and these kind of got me into being able to manage money. So even though I didn't have a degree, I had SEC credentials. And, um, and then after that, I, you, I met people, I started, um, reading invest, investing newsletters and kind of writing and co commenting about that. And then, um, I started sending emails, emails to people that were doing things that I, that I wanted to do and kind of working in the arena that I wanted to work in. And one of these emails was to Chris Weber, who's my now business partner, but I'd been following him for a number of years. And because of his advice, I had become a multimillionaire by my early twenties. And so what I decided to do was just send him a thank you note. I just said, you know, Chris, thank you so much for inspiring me as a kid, for helping me, um, to realize that my true passion is investing and for getting me to a position where I'm financially free now in my early twenties. And he wrote back and we hit it off uh, splendidly. Um, so much so that over a few months we actually formed an investment partnership and now here we are managing hundreds of millions of dollars in countries all around the world. And so gratitude, but, um, actively reaching out to people and then focusing on myself and putting myself in the best position possible to be able to realize the opportunities coming my way. You know, when I did due diligence on you, the one thing that rang true was just your ability to be more interested than interesting. You have a bi-monthly global report that's world-renowned, influential, and credible. Uh, so understanding those strategies yourself and utilizing them successfully has been one of the key components. Uh, those insights that you have uh, are critical to so many different people to plant seeds under trees uh, like you may never sit under, just like Chris planted a seed in you that he had no uh, knowledge of it at all. Um, where and how are you getting your information to create that influential newsletter that you have that so many people use today to understand the investment trends and strategies that exist? Sure. Um, you know, a, a lot of investing, investing is a kind of a mixture of science and philosophy in a sense where you have the raw fact, but then so much of it is just gut feeling and, and going off of what you know and what you've seen and experienced in the past. And so what we do is just at a very, you know, core level, we focus on what the Federal Reserve is doing and we focus on what the governmental policies coming into play are. So is money going into the economy, coming out of the economy, and then where are those dollars being directed? Prime example of this in 2011, um, Chris transitioned very heavily and myself, we transitioned heavily into the medical device sector. Um, it was clear that the Fed was going to produce a lot of new money, which was going into the economies and buying up assets. And then second to that, it was pretty obvious that Obama was going to get a second term, which meant that Obamacare was going to be passed. And so that means more people insured, more medical devices sold. And um, we ended up investing and doing really well in, in that sector. So those are the types of things we, we look for. And that's kind of how we do our analysis, just starting at a very what's going on in the global economies. And then also um, what's, what's the Fed doing and uh, what are the governments doing? Speaking of the Fed and the government, last question, I'm sure I'd be amiss not to ask, especially because you're a millennial expert, has to be crypto. Uh, what do we see for the future of crypto or what should we be looking at to understand it better? Sure. Um, I was not a, a big believer in crypto for the longest time, but I've recently been convinced because I have a lot of I have a lot of good friends that are doing a, a great job and doing very well in it. Um, the most exciting thing for me around crypto isn't necessarily the coins right now. It's the technology and the infrastructure that's being built around it to make them more usable because up and up until recently, they've kind of just been almost like buying a penny stock. You know, you can't really use it. You can't do anything with it. But the technologies now that are coming into play that, you know, are, they're allowing you to earn interest on them. They're allowing you to loan them out they're, It's making it a more practical thing for people. And I think that that's going to be a big indicator um, and, and a big, I guess, 
uh, wind at the back of the sector, if these technologies can get in place, it actually make them really easy to use for people and, and the transact business and the do barter and things like that. Yeah, I've always been a big fan of the picks and shovels. I used to call it yep. picks and axes, but someone told me it's better to say picks and shovels. Fair enough. Uh, in, anyway, um, Britton, thank you so much, man. You are a true entrepreneur. I love your consistent, persistent pursuit of your own potential, the way that you believe in yourself and you do the work, right? The law of uh, gravity, the law of Goya getting off your ass and the law of attraction all in one. You are the real deal. Uh, I have people can reach you at weberglobal.com. Anywhere else you want them to reach out to you? Uh, yeah, Instagram, you know, like I said, I'm trying to help out a lot of my friends here. So if anybody wants to DM me, uh, have a question, no question too small. I really enjoy giving back and talking to my friends and peers and people my age. So uh, shoot me a DM um, at Britton Hill. I guess I can comment that here. Yeah, uh, you get a comment at Britton Hill. Check him out. Let's do some more together. Go take that private jet to go have a good time, man. Don't forget to vacation every day. That's my advice to you. Vacation every day. Thanks, David. Take care. You got it, brother. Take care. Bye. What a success story. What a great entrepreneur. And he's giving back by sharing the secrets that made him a multimillionaire in his 20s. Uh, we're going to bring on Janessa Rose to ask me a question. Uh, she is the author and motivational speaker for the Motivational Monsters, motivationalmonsters.org. Here she is. Congratulations Hi. on your first book, by the way. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm so excited and so honored to be here with you. Thank you for having me. Well, your book is How to Stop Being an Effing Bum, B-U-M, the broken urban mentality that exists today that separates us from our own self-worth, our own ability to be happy, healthy, and wealthy, and realize what we do to interfere with it. Uh, but would love to, you know, have you share a little bit about the Motivational Monsters and then give me a quick question. Absolutely. All right. So I started Motivational Monsters back in 2018 um, as a, you know, incentive to use our stories to push us forward instead of victimize ourselves and constantly feeling like we can't do things because of what we've gone through. Life is life. It's going to kick ass sometimes and we have to push back. Um, so that's how I started that. I wanted to inspire others to use their stories to push forward. That turned into the book, which was pretty much a shove a little bit more to take a look at the things that you, you know, glorify. They're not really serving you. If they're not serving you, you're keeping yourself at a lower vibration and you're going to attract more situations to be victimized. That is awesome. And you have a question for me. Um, absolutely. Um, so basically, I just wanted to know, what do you think about uh, the victimizing mentality and how does that keep us stuck? You know, so that way I can have another spin on it. Yeah. So mine spins to the worlds that we live in, the worlds of perception that we see and the meaning that we give to things. And I think people have a lens that they use of three different worlds. And the worst one is the world that I was born in, you know, single mom, six kids in a socially you know, economically deprived world. Uh, and to me, it's a world of victimization. It's a world that happens to me. Uh, it's a world of below the line, blame, shame, and justification. Uh, and the mindset is one of scarcity. I call it the world of not enough. No matter what happens, there's not enough. And believe it or not, the kids that make it out of that environment, like myself, you know, they end up still having difficulty if they stay in that world, which I did. I could have a $40 million home and live in a world of not enough. There's still more to have. And we see that with billionaires all the time. It's just not enough. And they're victims. Everything's happening too. You know, their favorite slogan in the world is, why me? Even though they should set an example like you do with the motivational monsters and the stories, the try me stories, right? And when I was able to shift my perspective from why me to try me and to shift that perspective into a world of at least for me of, of just enough and then ultimately a world of more than enough, a world where you can live abundantly understanding it's okay to receive and just have the right intent. You know, money in that scarce world, it buys you love and happiness and there's never enough. But when you shift the paradigm and realize money's important as long as we shop for the right things, when we have the right attention and intention, the coincidences of that currency the object of energy comes into the flow so i think it's a matter of giving meaning to what we see having that try me attitude not a why me attitude understand and identify if we live in a world of not enough regardless of what we have if things are happening to you if you feel like a victim you need to change your perspective give new meaning to your life and the best way to do it is start doing good deeds start being like you are 
uh, you know, start sharing, planting seeds under trees that you'll never sit under, start sharing and empowering others by giving back and doing good deeds and sharing your stories and other people's stories in order to effectuate that unification that we're all one we're all here to help each other there's no gatekeepers we're all sponsors and power sponsors of one another regardless of where we are what we look like or or any type of beliefs that we have we should be looking and appreciating how we're the same and appreciating how we're different and i just commend you and applaud you where can people find your book uh, people can go on to amazon this is the bad boy right here if you check it out, thank you. If you check it out, it's on Amazon. Um, I'm Janessa Rose. You guys can also follow me on Instagram, DM me with anything. Um, I love that you were saying, you know, billionaires uh, go through the same thing with the victimizing. That's uh, one of the first things I mentioned in the book, that some of the richest people in the world are the biggest bums. And it's just an undeveloped mindset and belief, and they don't activate faith. And I just love what you do, and I'm a huge fan, and I'm, like I said, so honored uh, for you allowing me the platform to share this. Oh, Janessa, everyone's going to reach out. Janessa Rose, reach out to her, The Motivational Monsters, buy the book, learn the mindset that it takes, no matter what you have, to not be a victim and to empower yourself so you can empower other people. You are one of my 1000s. I so appreciate you taking the time. Thank you for writing mm -hmm. the book. Thank you for all you do. Thank you, David. Be well. Take care, Jess. Please right. keep in touch, Janessa. I Thank will. you. I definitely will. Bye. She's awesome. Thank all you. right. You get it. It's the mindset. Move yourself from the world of not enough. Things are not happening to you. Do not be a why me person. I would say to whiny, why me? Be a try me person. Try me. When things get tough, try me. Try me. I won't be here if I wasn't tried. So tried and tested and true. That's what we want to do. All right. Hey, Bonnie, good to see you there. Jake, double thumbs up to you as well. We're moving and grooving along. Now I got that Samir fan going. We got the famous basketball player in the Israeli Premier League, and uh, he is here to talk about as well his book, Godfidence. I, I love it. Uh, you cannot be confident without confidence, and uh, love to have our friend on here, Jahiva. Where are you, my friend? Are you here? Let's see. Uh, why don't you reach out, Jahiva Floyd? You are here. At Fetty Dot Floyd, I'm looking for you. There he is, the famous star. There we go. We're going live. Our, oh, maybe I did that. Hold on, let me make sure I did that right. Here we go. Uh, why won't I let? There we go. Whoa! Hey, how you doing? Good man. How are you? I'm doing good. Good man. I am just so intrigued. The title of your book is one of the best titles. I. My next book's going to be called Don't Do Business with Dicks, but I think uh, <laughs> confidence, confidence is, is better than that even. Yeah. Uh, you know, let's just start with the title, you yeah. know, because obviously the title has extreme meaning in your life. What is confidence? Uh, confidence for me is just knowing that someone's like working on your behalf behind the scenes. I uh, grew up having self-doubt as my, my, my problem. So, so I knew self-confidence wasn't it to get me to where I wanted to be. So just using my faith in, in God to really get me to where I am now. And, you know, a lot of people, when we say the word God, they get separated, mm -hmm. right? They get interfered with. Um, and I was one of those, you know, early on in life, I have a very religious family and I didn't understand the power of faith, whether you define it as God, source, Jesus, Muhammad, Joseph, Ms. Buddha, whatever it is, there's this great source of light, love, and lessons that connects us all. And it also gives you that confidence. You know, confidence is an indicator that you're touching and not creating the interference between you and what created the mountains in front of you, right? Like right. I saw the mountains and it fired me up to get over it, under it, through it, around it, lie to it, cheat it, manipulate it, fight it. And once I took that confidence perspective, mm -hmm. when I saw that mountain, I said to myself, hold on a second, that which <laughs> made that mountain is inside of me. That right. which made that mountain is beside me. Right. What am I afraid of? Why, what, what, what am I thinking? Mm -hmm. I, this is here to indicate something to me. It's not here to stop me. It's not here to do anything except for indicate I got a better place to be. And I'm going to go ahead and have faith that not only is the destination I'm looking to get to the one, 
but there's a better destination that somebody or something or somehow I'm going to get to. Right. At what age did you kind of have this shift in your perspective or the paradigm shift for you that what walks with you created that which is in front of you? Right. It was uh, around 22 on my first year overseas. And just being away from home, I was able to really dive into what I actually believe. I grew up in a religious family as well. So I actually took that time to really you know, hone in on my own faith and uh, separate it. So I had this spiritual awakening. And I realized, like, like you said, like we think that God is outside of us. But once we realize he's inside of us, we use that power and, uh, and really embrace that freedom within. I think religion uh, restricts us. Um, a lot. So when you have that, that journey within your own spirituality, I think that's where you find the power, the freedom, the love and the lessons through it all. And do you think it's an accident mm -hmm. that you're playing basketball in Israel and you had a spiritual awakening? Right. Yeah. Hey, my, my name is actually Je uh, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah. So I have, yeah. a, so when I first got here, I'm like, there's no coincidence why I'm here. So being at the, in the Holy Land, even people with the fans embraced me just like being that, you know, that symbol. So it's, it's been a great experience. I've learned a lot of the um, backstory of the Bible, um, just learning that history and really, you know, honing in on my faith. Yeah, it's amazing how sometimes we get anointed with even the naming of ourselves or a naming of the book. It's almost an anointing. My, my name, uh, David Meltzer, means beloved servant. And mm -hmm. so I have no doubt what my purpose is as well. Right. And as the Jehovah J Jireh, the, the God of giving and abundance uh, and, and inspiration. Um, you know, how do you reconcile the pragmatic world of the consistent behavior that you have to participate in to be a professional basketball player with kind of this more ethereal, spiritual purpose in your life? How do you reconcile that? Because I think a lot of entrepreneurs and athletes have difficulty reconciling, you know, putting so much effort into a pragmatic function while they live in an ethereal or inspirational world. Right. That's where the book came from, because I before I didn't know how to balance it, too. And I thought it had to be either or. I mean, just growing up and being having church be my like my priority and then basketball being I'm six, eight. So I ha I'm sure God has a plan for me to play basketball. So I think the book was just me literally writing down, trying to um, figure out how to rec reconcile with it. And I just realized that. I had a lot of childhood trauma I needed to heal from and just learn how to be my authentic self. So I think just being able to open up about my, my mistakes um, and also just being an advocate for God is just, I think as human, we just have that, you know, that balance, you have to find it within. So I just been able to write, uh, write about it and really inspire others to be themselves. And beyond that, you know, we are all on our own journey. We're practicing the best that I can. One of the advantages, I was an average Division three football player. So I don't think God, God anointed me to be a, a professional athlete at 5'7 and 145 pounds. But uh, moreover, you know, understanding uh, that, uh, and now I just threw myself off, I was going to ask you, uh, in, 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 that, in that journey, though, um, I'm 53 years old now, 16 years on a, on a serious journey uh, of spiritual enlightenment, of, of finding this, but yet I'm still afraid. I, I still make mistakes. I'm an imperfect being. How have you or do you deal with fear? Because in your pragmatic mind, you know how ridiculous it is, right? Because right. You, you've gone through this anointment of a spiritual awakening, but yet even though we know certain things, we don't act always that which we know and that which is in, within us. How do you deal with those inadequacies and the fears that you have? Right, I, I just, you, the best thing you can do is embrace them. I have, it's just one scripture, there's no fear in love. It's just, I think on my journey, is learning how to love really takes away my fear. And just being, addressing it and really talking about it. I think when we talk about our pain, talk about our fears, those are the times of releasing is we're um, opening the conversation about shame and, and and different things. So I think just being able to keep going and talking about it and build a community around it is the best way to go for me. You know, last thing, everything has, everybody has trauma in their lives and uh, difficulties that help shape us. And today, because of the pandemic, you know, people are separate, depressed, anxious, even suicidal. Some of these thoughts are thoughts that you had when you were younger as well. 
Um, what advice do you give to people today that are anxious and frustrated and even suicidal? What advice would you give to them? I think the best thing that happened for me was just being able to find different outlets and reading was one of them. And one thing I learned about being having anxiety and depression is really trying to learn how to be present. Um, I read The Power of Now and it was just telling me about like how when we just sit there and slow down and um, focus on right now, all our problems really go away. And, and we talk about anxiety is thinking about the future and depression is thinking about the past and um, trying to manage this image that we're, we're having through life. But when we really try to find a beauty in life, I think that is the best way to go and really trying to manage this, the, the mental illnesses we, we face and the traumas we've uh, gotten along the way. So it just, and I also, therapy is a good thing. I, I've talked to people, I've had mentorship. Mentorship is also good. So I think talking about it, and I, I've been trying to do this with my platform, is being a talk about as an athlete, as a former pastor's kid, there's a lot of things people don't talk about on a daily basis. So I just try to be that person to have courage to, re you know, just, you know, um, face it and go on with it. Yeah, being vulnerable is an aspect of being invulnerable. It gives us actually confidence uh, when we tell the truth, uh, when we're vulnerable about what we think and how we feel. Mm -hmm. uh, the truth itself brings confidence. It brings confidence because it right. clears the interference between us and that powerful source. And, you know, my book, Connected to Goodness, which, you know, I got to send to you, but I also give to anybody out there, ebook, uh, audio book, or I'll sign it and pay for shipping. I don't care. Uh, <laughs> so go ahead, email me, david at dmeltzer.com so I know where to send it. Uh, okay. But they both talk about this idea of the truth. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I was saying the truth vibrates the fastest. The truth will eventually always come out. You know, for you, how important is it to tell the truth, whether it be to others or be truthful to yourself? Yeah, living in truth was the really the um, how I got over. It's just like once you face the truth, is like you're free from all the lies and deceitfulness around you. Um, I think it's hard to live in truth, but like you said before, it's take the vulnerability to really do it. And, and I think along my journey, I've just been able to uh, be disciplined, um, really try to keep practicing on a daily basis. So I think living in truth is the best thing to go to. That is awesome. Any last questions you have for me or anything I can do for you? I actually was going around uh, on your page and you, and you say like, you've worked with a lot of athletes and going into entrepreneurship. What, what are some challenges you, you saw that athletes face trying to make the transition? Well, the number one is very ironic to me is that the resistance to coaching and business, which is so weird because if I asked you, you know, how old were you when you had your first basketball coach, you'd probably tell me five or six. Uh, and you had no problem, as you know, you, you were probably one of the better kids when you were younger just because of your height. Uh, mm -hmm. But more importantly, you never resisted having a coach, a mentor uh, throughout college at Holy Cross, a right? defensive player of the year, all the things you probably even credited your coach. But for some reason, when athletes get into the entrepreneur world, the business world, where they actually may not be as quantumly suited, as blessed or anointed in order to effectuate the success early on that they had in sports, well, they have some room to catch up even if they are. You know, mm -hmm. if, I, if I took a five-year-old and put him on the basketball court with Michael Jordan, there'd be a competitive advantage, you right. know, that any, any NBA player would have or you would have over a five-year-old, no matter how, how much skill, knowledge, and desire they had at five. Well, there's some time that it takes and some coaching that's necessary. And... Unfortunately, I think those are the two things that make it so difficult for a hyper successful professional athlete or college athlete to understand that they weren't overnight successes. Mm -hmm. Even LeBron James was not an overnight success. And right. he always has coaches. He has more coaches now than he's ever had. Mm -hmm. And he knows more about the game than he ever has. Uh, and so we need to make sure people feel comfortable asking for help make sure they feel comfortable having the patience to develop the skills, knowledge, and utilize the desire that they have that has consistently and persistently increased their ability to be successful at what they did on the court to understand it off the court. Now, because a lot of the skills, knowledge, and desire is translatable, it shouldn't take as long 
to get to the hyper successful level as an entrepreneur that it did. But you're probably gonna have a very difficult time if you don't have a coach and you don't have the blend between patience and persistence. And it would be an honor to coach you, my friend, anytime you want in entrepreneurship. Yeah. I'm a big fan of yours. You have the right Appreciate mindset, it. but even more importantly, you have the right heart set uh, to make this happen. So thank you so much for joining me. Uh, where can people get the book and find you? Uh, people can get the book. Here it is right here on Amazon. Um, you can find me on jihadafloyd.com or you can follow me on Instagram at Fetty underscore Floyd. Fetty understand Floyd. I love underscore Floyd. I love the name of your book. You <laughs> and I are completely aligned. For we sure. must be brothers from another mother, at least in another <laughs> li lifetime. Yeah, so sure. thank you so much. Enjoy Israel. Keep on thank winning you. both on and off the court. And thank you for helping so many people. Take care, Java. Thank you, David. Bye-bye. Bye. Betty underscore Floyd right there. Check him out on Instagram. Buy his book, Godfidence. Can you beat that name? I don't think so. All right, we're getting close. We are getting close in two hours and 25 minutes. We're going to have training on a go, no go plan. I'm going to teach you how to create a higher statistical success in managing and developing a vision in business and life by creating a go, no go plan. We're going to talk about that at training today. All the trainings are featured on Spotify. Google, iTunes, check it out, The Playbook, one of the top podcasts in the world, The Playbook, download it, like it, share it. We have billionaires, millionaires, entrepreneurs, celebrities, athletes, and entertainers on The Playbook. Please like it and share it. Just check it out. It's the Napoleon Hill of podcasts. You'll love it. I'm going to take one more question before I get to training today. Here we go. When did you know you were special? Woo. Probably the last, I don't know, 10 years, I've been told I was special, both in a positive and a negative way. Um, but I believe it. I know what I am. I'm healthy, I'm wealthy, and I'm happy. And when things happen that make me feel otherwise, I just look to see what's interfering with my health, happiness, and wealth. And I make the adjustments with confidence in me, the connected to goodness in me. If anybody wants my five daily practices or my book, go ahead, david at dmelter.com. It's free, ebook, audiobook. I'll sign the book to you, send it, pay for shipping. David at dmelter.com. I got five daily practices to help you with all of these things. I have a text community if you want to join it, 949 298 2905. It's always a pleasure to be here. We got training in a couple hours. Join me there. It's on Clubhouse. Uh, the trainings are on Instagram. The trainings are in a webinar. I think we're over 45,000 people registered for today's training. That's not counting the playbook and how many of the hundreds of thousands of people listen and watch it there. We are blessed to have such a great community. And the reason is be kind to your future self and do good deeds. Thank you so much. We'll see you in a couple hours. Thanks.